chia versus flax. It's like a Bernese mountain dog versus a St. Bernard pulling a carriage full of rhubarbs. Who's gonna get to the eggplant factory first? It's so easy to look at chia and flax and say, they're both fibers. As a matter of fact, they're both insoluble fibers. They're both just equally good or equally bad. We have to look at it a little bit differently, right? We look at fats and we say, oh, there's polyunsaturated fats, there's monounsaturated fats, there's saturated fats, and there's all these subclassifications there. But with fibers, we really do need to look at just different things. We need to look at the kind of fiber. We need to look at whether it's soluble or insoluble, yada, yada. We're gonna go into detail with that. But before I get into exquisite detail with that, there's some groundwork that I need to cover. And feel free to skip ahead in this video if you need to, but I think this groundwork's gonna be important. First, let's touch insoluble versus soluble. Insoluble fiber, that's like the fiber you get mainly from roughage, from veggies and things like that. Uh, it's good for transit time. It's good for kind of pushing things through the gut. That being said, still very beneficial. There's a study that was published in the journal Nutrition that looked at human epidemiological research as well as rodent mechanistic research, mechanisms of actions and things like that. It actually found that insoluble fiber, like from veggies, was actually better when it came down to stopping or slowing down the potential insulin resistant risk, insulin resistance risk, I should say. So what that essentially is meaning is that they seem to have a powerful impact on carbohydrates, which is very, very good. But some people get concerned that with insoluble fiber, you're increasing transit time. Okay, now by increasing transit time, you're pushing things through the gut faster, which means that you're probably gonna absorb less carbohydrates. That makes sense with the insulin resistance thing. But it could be negative when it comes down to protein, right? Because we want protein to absorb. I don't wanna go too far down this rabbit hole, the bottom line is that it doesn't really matter because protein can still elicit a little bit of an insulin response. And if you have fiber with your protein, it can potentially lessen that insulin resistance risk by lowering that insulin spike. Okay, insoluble fiber coming from veggies, things like that. Then we have soluble fiber. That's the fiber that is, well, like chia, like flax, where it is more soluble. It draws water in. Like if you put water with chia seeds, they kind of get gelatinous. So soluble fiber is, from a mechanical standpoint, very, very different. So soluble fiber is good at like grabbing things. For instance, there was a study that was published in the journal Nutrition Reviews that found that soluble fiber was better at reducing circulating LDL cholesterol. It can actually grab it from the diet and help you kind of push it out. Like, that way you're not really absorbing it. Also has a uh, role when it comes down to blood pressure modulation, and of course has a role when it comes down to glucose as well. But the biggest benefit that we have to spend a little bit of time on with soluble fiber is how it affects what are called short chain fatty acids. Now I cannot overemphasize this enough. Short chain fatty acids are the end result of eating a high fiber diet or getting good amounts of fiber. Short chain fatty acids play a role in so many things. They are not just the end result of what bacteria eat. Okay, short chain fatty acids work on fatty acid metabolism. They help us digest and utilize fats. They help us utilize carbohydrates so maybe our blood sugar doesn't spike quite as much. A ton of different things. Okay, so soluble fiber, when it goes into the gut, it feeds the microbiome. Insoluble fiber pushes things through, soluble fiber feeds the microbiome, okay? And the microbiome feeds on the soluble fiber and the end result of that is short chain fatty acids or are short chain fatty acids, which have these huge effects. Let's dive into this for just a minute before we get specifically into chia versus flax, it's very important. We used to think that short chain fatty acids were just an end result of the microbiome, uh, eating on things and then they have their own effect on the metabolism, yada, yada. But now we're seeing that when we increase short chain fatty acids by consuming more soluble fiber, the short chain fatty acids then have a positive impact on our gut microbiome. So it's creating this positive cycle. Here's how it works. We have this thing called immunoglobulin A, okay, IgA. It is an antibody that is in our gut, immunoglobulin A. What happens is this IgA, okay, it binds to bacteria's membrane in our gut, but it only binds to bacteria that we should be keeping. So if IgA binds to a bacteria, okay, that bacteria stays. If the IgA does not bind to a bacteria, that bacteria leaves. There's even evidence that there is a refuge. IgA can take selective bacteria, sequester them into an area where they are protected if those bacteria should be there but wouldn't have a good chance of surviving. 
So IGA is like the master regulating who stays, who goes, and who gets their life spared in the way of bacteria. Very important. But what does that have to do with short chain fatty acids? Well, short chain fatty acids help in two very important ways. One, they provide a fuel for the epithelial cells and they provide a fuel to produce the antibodies. So the short chain fatty acids become a fuel source. Yeah, so if we're not eating a lot of fiber, we're not getting soluble fiber, we're not getting a lot of that fuel source, we're not getting a lot of those short chain fatty acids, that can't really fuel this whole antibody process. Case in point, then your bacterial diversity decreases, right? And there's studies that demonstrate that people that have lower levels of IgA have less microbiome diversity. This is very, very important. The second piece is something more complicated, which we'll touch on in a little bit, called histone deacetylase inhibition. Long story long, basically what that does is it makes it so that genes can get activated, get expressed, that therefore allow the production of more IgA. More IgA equals more protective mechanism over bacteria. Let's get into chia and flax, because enough about the St. Bernard and the Bernese Mountain Dog. You don't want to hear about this nonsense. Anyway. So when you look at chia, you say, well, chia has like 10 grams more fiber per 100 gram serving than flax. So chia must just be better, right? Well, not necessarily. You see, chia only has three grams of soluble fiber per 100 grams. Flax has 10 grams of soluble fiber per 100 grams. Now we create short chain fatty acids by our microbiome, of course, eating soluble fiber. So one of the questions that people do ask is, should I take probiotics? Should I help increase my you know, microbial diversity that way? Look, the evidence is kind of all over the place, but I will tell you what I personally use. I do use a probiotic. I use something called a Symbiotic, and I put a link for the one that I use down below. It's a Symbiotic called Seed. Now, they are a sponsor on this channel, full disclaimer. They're awesome. They've been a sponsor for a while, but a Symbiotic has prebiotics and probiotics, so it has a little bit of the fibers that are going to help the bacteria potentially grow. Okay, so they're very unique with a capsule inside of a capsule. So probiotics are very well researched, right? There's a lot of evidence there, but the thing I like about Seed, which by the way, there's a 15% discount link in the description below. The thing I like about Seed is that they do a lot of their own research and they're really pushing a lot of the microbiome research. So they're putting their money where their mouth is. So anyway, that link is down below. If you use that code that's in the description, you will save 15% off of some Seed probiotics. So a big thank you to Seed for being a sponsor on this video. And again, make sure you check them out. Okay, we already know from what I've talked about that soluble fiber carries a heck of a lot of benefits but there's something even more with flax. And I'll give you the short answer. Flax is better than chia, but chia is good for other things too. Let's first touch on what chia can do that's pretty unique. The European Journal of Clinical Nutrition published a paper that didn't look at a whole lot of people. It looked at 11 people, but it's still interesting. They gave people either regular bread or bread that had chia seeds added to it. They found that the group that had the chia seeds ended up having a much more stable level of blood sugar. They didn't have the big spikes and they were significantly more satiated. So chia from like a weight loss standpoint makes sense. Eat that chia pudding up. Don't be afraid of chia. The next study was published in the journal Diabetes Care. This was a 12 week longer human study that took a look at type two diabetics. Okay. It gave them 37 grams of chia seeds added to their diet each day. After 12 weeks, they had a pretty significant reduction in their HbA1c. They even had lower blood pressure. And what I found most intriguing is they had lower levels of C-reactive protein. Their inflammatory markers went down. So chia, heck yes, all the way. But why is flax superior? Well, when you're looking at soluble fiber to soluble fiber, they're not the same. Just because it's a soluble fiber doesn't mean it's the same as another soluble fiber. Just like a polyunsaturated fat from fish oil that's an omega-3 is different from a polyunsaturated fat that is a seed oil that's an omega-6. Different things. In this particular case, flax contains a fiber known as arabinoxalins. Arabinoxalins, in a study that was published in the journal Bioactive Carbohydrates and Dietary Fibers, was found to end up increasing short-chain fatty acids, particularly butyrate, which we'll talk about in a second increased butyrate way more than any other fiber tested. And arabinoxalins increase total short chain fatty acids significantly more than even pectin. And pectin is a fiber that is notorious for improving short chain fatty acid levels. So flax with this arabinoxalins, a specific kind of soluble fiber, has a tremendous impact on our short chain fatty acid production. And if you've been listening to what I've been saying, short chain fatty acids are so powerful. So in this case, we're talking specifically about butyrate. 
Butyrate is probably the most powerful or at least the most researched short chain fatty acid. Now there was an interesting study that was published in the FASEB journal and this was specifically on butyrate. And this found that higher levels of butyrate inhibited the secretion of something called IL-12, interleukin-12, which is a pro-inflammatory cytokine. So it suppressed an inflammatory signal there. And it increased IL-10, interleukin-10, which is known as an anti-inflammatory cytokine. So we have a powerful inflammation modulation effect there. But here's one that I find super fascinating. The Journal of Biological Chemistry found that butyrate, which again is heavily stimulated by arabinoxalins from flax, ended up increasing glucagon-like peptide 1. Now, glucagon-like peptide 1, super powerful when it comes down to suppressing appetite. One of the most powerful ways to suppress appetite, but also helps improve glucose tolerance. So if you are on a weight loss journey, this is so powerful for you. Okay, because we're looking at, again, butyrate improving this entire process. But one of the most fascinating things is the world of, like I mentioned earlier, histone deacetylase inhibition. What the heck? That sounds so complicated. Well, okay, here's how flax interacts in that particular case. Okay, so you have our DNA. Our DNA is locked up with these things called histones. These histones keep our DNA wrapped really tight so things called transcription factors can't really activate it very well. Basically, what happens is we have our DNA and we need to express certain genes out of that. That's how things change. That's how we become who we are as people. But if it's under lock and key all the time, we don't get to live up to our full genetic potential, for lack of a better term. Okay, so what's happening here is butyrate, this short chain fatty acid that comes from consuming fibers, right? This butyrate is a histone deacetylase inhibitor, meaning it unlocks the histones so that the DNA is accessible and it becomes accessible to transcription factors that are very much so associated with the mitochondrial health of people, of rodents, whatever. Okay, so that means from a metabolic standpoint, you are able to express potentially more genes that are good for fat burning, that are good for the metabolism. You're able to express genes that are usually locked up in people that are overweight or obese or have metabolic issues. Okay, and we see that in studies that are done with ketones because ketones are very similar to butyrate. We don't need to go down that rabbit hole, but molecularly, only one hydroxy group off. So when you look at that equation, flax with its very specific kind of fiber that drives butyrate up significantly more, that's a much more powerful fiber, okay? When you look at chia, you still have the soluble fiber. You just have a lesser amount of it. But because you have a higher ratio of insoluble fiber, you're getting more of a blood sugar modulation effect. So chia is more powerful for satiety, and chia is more powerful when it comes down to probably keeping you full at like a literal level, like being satiated, being like, I don't feel like I really need to eat. Whereas flax is a little bit more of an underlying like genetic manipulator, right? It's actually helping you out from a metabolic standpoint, but it's also signaling glucagon-like peptides, sending signals to help keep you a little more satiated, okay? Now, I wanna end on one very important thing because a lot of people will say this. They'll say flax increases estrogen. I'm gonna just, I'm gonna do a separate video on this, but I will just give you the recap of it. There's a study that was published in the journal Frontiers in Nutrition that looked at flax, right? And it found that flax doesn't really increase estrogen. As a matter of fact, it may even potentially decrease it because they found that flax could even affect breast cancer in a positive way by making it so that it binds to an estrogen receptor, making it so that the estrogen that is in your body cannot send an estrogen signal. So essentially, because it kind of looks like estrogen, a downstream molecule that kind of comes as a result of eating flax, it binds to the estrogen receptor, making it so that estrogen receptor is not able to get a signal from estrogen. That's actually a powerful thing. So meaning the downstream effect of estrogen on your body ends up being potentially less. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel and I'll see you tomorrow.